being that it is 6.30, I'd like to welcome everybody who is here and thank you all for coming and we're gonna stand for the pledge. like to get this meeting going. Mrs. Perry? Dr. McBride? Here. Mr. Perez? Here. Dr. Gase? Here. Mr. Kisabeth? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Wonderful. I'd entertain a motion to adopt the agenda, Mrs. Perry. Are there any corrections or addendums? We do have an addendum, and that is on the consent agenda, item 7.03 for employment to add a non-renewal for basketball head varsity girls. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda with the amendment? So moved. Second. Mrs. Perry? Dr. Case? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Kisabeth? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. At this point, uh, it looks like we're turning it over to Mr. Trisler for a Colombian presentation. Well, good evening, members of the board. Uh, I've got our student board representatives, our seniors here uh, to help present the highlights um, and accomplishments this year. We had a great graduation yesterday. The weather worked out perfectly. Um, the rolling graduation times, I think, were successful um, to make sure that we were able to um, have an, an outdoor graduation that was safe for um, you know, all of our grandparents um, and, and any folks um, that, that might be immunocompromised. Um, very, very pleased to report to you that as of now, um, 210 of 217 of our seniors um, have all uh, graduated. Um, we hope to pick up at least three or four more of those students with coursework that they still owe over the summer um, and work that they can do um, you know, at summer school. So without further ado, the highlights of our year. Uh, we're gonna start with the business department. Uh, big things happen this year. Nine entrepreneurship students earn their Bitcoin for Everyone certification through Sailor University. Uh, the intro to business class had students earn over $20,000 in scholarships through regional academic challenges. And additionally, six of those intro to business students advanced to nationals competing in the Junior Achievement Titan Challenge. All six placed nationals with Tiffin claiming both the second and third place. Uh, in the English department, your book is taking off again and we be offered as a class next year with 25 students already signed up. The Tiffinian newspaper went fully digital this year and released the monthly digital newspaper that was free and accessible for all students. Uh, to highlight certain teachers, Ms. Ms. Cottom's students read a total of 285 books on their own this school year, not including uh, the literature circles or books read uh, that are mandatory. Uh, her, first, her, her fifth period class read a total of 76 books and won the book race. They'll be treated to pizza on Friday. Several teachers introduced literature circles that allowed students to have a voice and choice in their reading, creating high buy-in and high success. All Tiffin Columbian seniors successfully, successfully completed their English 12 class. In the math department, 11 students took AP Calculus AB this year. Uh, in social studies, 95 students took an AP Social Studies class. Uh, those include AP Government, AP Psychology, and AP US History. Two of uh, the two Columbian students won the essay writing competition for the Seneca County Republicans uh, Central Committee and in art, two students qualified for the governor's show. Uh, these students were Anna Reuter and Mary Kidwell. Okay, regarding the band, Columbian instrumental music students received eight superior ratings and three excellent ratings at the Ohio Musical Education Association Solo and Ensemble Adjudicated Event. And regarding the TC Jazz Band, they were able to perform at the TU Pro Music Festival this year, and they received positive and helpful feedback from the judging panel. 
That was also the last appearance of beloved Christopher Kenny as our director. And Ry Kistner, Isaac Cortez, and Rylan Clarkson were selected for the District 2 OMEA Honor Band. Ry Kistner, Rylan Clarkson, Jacob Clarkson, Dylan Reed, and Curtis Steele were selected for the Heidelberg University Honor Musical Festival. The TC Wind Ensemble qualified for state this year, earning a superior rating at District Meet and received an excellent rating at state. And overall, by the end of 2022 academic school year, all instrumental music activities were operating on normal capacities. Regarding the TC Theater Department, Columbian was revived their spring musical this year with Chicago the High School Edition. The leads included Kennedy Lackner, Amelia Nisley, Isaac Cortez, Caitlin Albright, Catherine Albright, Weston Runyon, and Annalise Foles, and Cole Newlove on the piano. For choir, concerts were back in the auditorium with no audience size limit, mask mandates, or ticket-only events. Concert choir and gold choir participated in D2 Ohio Music Education Association large group adjudicated event and received superior ratings. Fifteen vocal students participated in a variety of events at D2 solo and ensemble. Out of 15 solos, 10 received superior as the highest marking, four received excellence, and one received a good mark. Three students auditioned and were accepted into the D2 Ohio Music Education Association Festival Choir, which was held in January, but was unfortunately canceled due to COVID concerns. Uh, we're now gonna move on to the athletics portion where we'll break it up into sections. Starting off with cheerleading. Uh, the cheerleaders won, as you guys know, the state competition in game day routine non-building. Uh, football, they finished eight and four playing a very tough schedule, top five schedule in the region. Uh, Brody Conley uh, was a two-time state champion wrestling. Brett Minnick, Maddox Simcoe, and Max Ray all finished as state qualifiers, and the overall team finished in the top 20 for overall GPA in the state of Ohio. Uh, in the baseball terms, uh, they were SBC champions this year. Several first-team players, Carson Lott, Jaden Myers, a couple second-team, Bryce and Braden Rogo, and, oh, Gunther Kissel, wow. Individuals and co-player of the year was Carson Mallott. <clears throat> Continuing with uh, basketball, the boys basketball team finished as district runner-ups with a 19-6 overall record. They had several All-Ohio um, recognition players, including Logan Beeson and Bryce Burns, all academic All-Ohio, as well as All-District and SBC honors. The team finished 12th in the state for Team GPA with a uh, GPA of 3.84. Uh, for boys tennis, we were SBC champs for the second year in a row. We swept first team honors in the league and had the player of the year in Jacob Weingart. And at districts, Jacob Weingart, Brian Cecil, and Trey Shuey earned second team district honors. Uh, girls tennis, we had the SBC player of the year, Kelsey Weingart. And first team doubles, Madison Wise and Mackenzie Davis. Ladies Cross Country was a four-time defending SBC champs, won several invitationals, qualified for regionals, and the ladies, all, six of the ladies earned first or second team All-SBC awards. And finally, concerning the track team, several athletes moved forward from the district meet on Saturday with the potential to break out into regionals, including my brother. And I believe that'll be held Wednesday and Saturday. And... Um, Quiz Bowl, TC Quiz Bowl won the North Division of the NCOESC League, then placed second overall in the league at the tournament in December. Team also placed third at the OAC Regionals and were granted a spot in the OAC State Competition, where they placed 15th overall in Ohio. And throughout the year, the team played in eight day-long tournaments, including our own, the Columbian Exposition 8. Next year's home tournament will be on October 1st. Regarding academics, senior-to-be Kelsey Weingart will be recognized in some way by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation next year based on her outstanding academic work on the PSAT this fall. And teachers began using Wicklet and Flipgrid to create current data to enhance student learning. Within the counseling department, uh, there is a successful implementation of the Signs of Suicide program in health classes this year will have at least a 96.7 graduation rate in spite of all the challenges from the last several years. 
Uh, there was a hosting of 20 plus college slash military reps at Tim and Columbian High School. There was a record number of students applying to Sentinel, 273 total applicants, and they were there were 23 seniors who earned a cumulative GPA of 4.0 or higher. In the special education slash transition services sector, 25 students are now receiving now receiving opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities employment services. And additionally, 15 students received school and agency coll collaborated support for pre-employment and or driver's education training. And finally, Student Council donated $61 to the St. Paul's UMC Sharing Kitchen. They also donated $107, $107 to the Seneca County Humane Society. <clears throat> In addition to this, they successfully hosted a homecoming dance outside to stay COVID safe for 605 students, and they also hosted a junior and senior prom for 394 students at Meadowbrook Ballroom. And finally, in breaking news, um, Friday we learned that there was a scoring error that was in Tiff and Columbian's favor um, at the Junior Achievement National Titan competition. We had um, uh, our team finish um, second and then due to the scoring error, we found out that our team actually took third. So two of Mrs. Geiger's um, business teams um, took second and third nationally. The only high school that we lost to was Yarmouth High School out on Cape Cod, um, beating a, a number of uh, other stellar high schools. So very proud of our students. Um, as you can see, we've had broad and diverse um, success this year. There is something for everyone at Tiffin Columbian High School. I'm happy and proud to report to the Board of Education um, that we have moved out of the pandemic. Um, the uh, um, well is primed and there is uh, going to be continued success um, for, for years to come. Our kids rise to the um, uh, occasion firm believer when kids have high expectations not only will they achieve but they overachieve and we see that out of our students um, across our student body um, moreover we have a fantastic f uh, faculty um, that without a doubt is one of the most caring and student-centered faculties um, that i've had the pleasure of working with um, so very very proud of all that's happened at columbian high school sure there's been some bumps here and there uh, over the course of the year um, but I think when you look at the broad work um, that our kids and our faculty have done, um, you, should, uh, you should be proud of, of what you have at Columbian High School. Um, furthermore, last point of the night, um, and this is some incoming data that we're going to look at a little further, 55% um, of our students achieve one year's growth or greater on the Procore assessments, and that is going to put us um, in great territory coming out of this pandemic, quickly closing the gap, uh, the achievement gap, um, as, as well as closing learning gaps um, and getting our kids um, back on track, moving forward um, to be successful tornadoes for years to come. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Mr. Trisler, and to each of your student reps who have just done a phenomenal job all year. And Mr. Trisler, thank you for all of your service to the district and to the high school as well. He's already up there. He's going to turn it over to Mr. Bose. Thank you, Dr. McBride. It is indeed my pleasure to recognize the third quarter Crystal Apple Award winner for our certified staff. Um, Mrs. Jane Dietrich, would you please come forward? Mrs. Dietrich was nominated by Mary Jo Rader and Debbie Hamilton, both working in our ED unit at Noble. Jane currently teaches fourth grade at Noble 4-5 Elementary. She has been a teacher for Tiffin City Schools for the past 31 years. Jane holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the Ohio State University and a Master's of Arts in Education from Heidelberg University. In the area of teaching excellence, this is what Mary Jo and Debbie had to say about Jane. Jane has amazing discipline and classroom control as students maintain attention throughout instruction time and are undeterred by interruptions. Her lessons are well thought out, challenging, as well as fun. She has high expectations and students strive to meet these dailies, daily. Since her lessons are engaging and fun, the students participate readily. 
in the area of commitment. This is what they said about Mrs. Dietrich. Jane is committed to the education of all students. She expects all students to learn facts, vocabulary, and spelling words through repeated practice. Jane is committed to working with other teachers and paraprofessionals to help her students achieve what seemed impossible at the beginning of the lesson. One example would be a student from the ED classroom made huge strides in Jane's class. This happened because once Jane saw the student's potential, she committed to helping the student even more. This gesture was remarkable and life-altering for this particular student. In the area of leadership, Jane demonstrates excellence in the day-to-day -day teaching and ac activities that make her leadership look easy. She was elected to assist with ED students because of these skills that she possesses. She is an example of professionalism as she speaks positively of her colleagues, administrators, and all of her students. In the area of student-centered, Jane encourages students in a positive manner. She listens to students' thoughts and ideas and challenges them to think outside the box to create deeper learning. All students are treated with the same respect and understanding. And in the area of accomplishments and awards, uh, they said Jane should have a long list of awards, um, but she's way too modest for that. Um, her accomplishments, though, would include every student that has been through her class because of the success that they have shown. So, Jane, thank you for all you do. Congratulations on receiving this award. We're proud of you and so very fortunate to have you in the TCS family. Thank you, Jane. Congratulations. Can I give you a hug? Thank you once. No, I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> I'm humbled and I'm honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> If it's all right, Dr. McBride, I'll move right into retirement recognitions. All right, our first retirement honoree is Mrs. Tammy Aldrich. Mrs. Aldrich, please come forward. Give me this. Give me a second. Welcome. Tammy Aldrich has spent 25 years in the field of education, the last five at Tiffin Middle School as a paraprofessional. Her interest in education began with her mom, who was an elementary teacher for 33 years. Mrs. Aldrich's passion for autism began when her son Tyler, living with autism, was born. That passion led her into the classroom, her happy place, where it fueled her to support those with challenges to make a difference in their lives, both socially and academically. In the course of that work, she soon discovered the students were really her teacher rather than her teaching them. Thinking she had spent her time trying to challenge children, she realized it was she who was really changed. Her plans for retirement are to spend time with, with family, which includes her husband of 35 years, Al, and sons Jake as, and his wife, Madison, and Tyler. She has one grandson, Rip, and a granddaughter on the way. In addition to spending time with the family, she'll travel, be a grandma, and work on home projects. Tammy's retirement isn't a goodbye, but rather a see you later, as she plans to return as a sub here in the near future. Tammy, thank you for all you do. We appreciate all of your service. Congratulations on your retirement. Sure. You want to say a few words? Thank you, everyone. What I whispered to Bob is now I don't have to ask anyone to go on a cruise. I can just go. <laughs> Thank you. Our next individual we want to honor is Sheila Comer. Sheila, please come forward. Sheila Comer worked in Tiffin City Schools Food Service Department for 22 years. She worked both breakfast and lunch at Noble Elementary. Sheila took her job very seriously and was known as a very dependable employee, a real team player. One thing she enjoyed the most about her job was getting to know the students and seeing them grow over their time at Noble. 
She made the students her first priority as she treated each one with respect, a smile, and a comforting or encouraging word. Sheila was well liked by all of her coworkers, exhibiting a good work ethic. She practiced the philosophy of doing the job once and doing it properly. In summary, Sheila Comer is a remarkable person and an outstanding employee for Tiffin City Schools. Thank you, Sheila, for all you do. Congratulations and good luck with your retirement. I just wanted to say thank you for letting me take care of those kids all those years, and I do miss it, but thank you. Next, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Trizler come back up to the mic. Good evening again. I am uh, pleased, proud, and honored to uh, congratulate Mr. Tom Cahill, uh, Tiffin City Schools uh, Intervention Specialist who is retiring after 10 years of service to the district at Columbia High School with a total of 17 years in education following a successful 21-year career as an agriculture commodities trader and merchandising manager. Mr. Cahill, um, taught individualized math, math lab, and inclusion math classes throughout his time uh, at TC. Tom's co-teacher, Don Fursler, says, Tom has been awesome to work with, and he has added a lot in our co-taught co classes. I will truly miss him as a co-worker and friend. I echo that sentiment. Um, Tom uh, also served as uh, our detention monitor for the past five years, and the thing that strikes me about Tom is um, not only would he just deal with detentions, but he would work with the kids um, on math um, in detention and help them get better. Tom and I had a handshake agreement for the last um, four years. Anytime I was working with a kid that needed math help, I'd get him up to Tom after school and let him know, you're not in detention, but you can go up and work with Mr. Cahill to get better and get help with math. Um, Mr. Cahill is uh, one of our most student-centered teachers, um, and he has a passion for helping students succeed and achieve. Um, Tom gets the most out of his kids because he builds strong relationships with them, and his students know he truly cares about them as a people as well as their success. Um, my favorite personal anecdote about Tom uh, is, um, in addition to how student-centered he is, it's his personalized license plate that says, I am TC. Um, that's true in multiple facets. He is TC, Tom Cahill, but moreover, he embodies um, the characteristics that I am most proud of our staff um, at Columbian. He's student-centered, um, he is caring, he's dedicated to students, and he truly embodies um, what our staff is all about at TC. He demonstrates those qualities and values daily um, in his work with students, and we are really going to miss Tom in the future. Tom, congratulations on a fine career. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Trisler. Thank you, Board of Education. Um, thank you to my colleagues. I've always said when I've moved on to a different position that I'm not going to miss the work, but I'll miss the people. And that's never more true than right here tonight, too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Conger? Thank you, Mr. Bose, Board of Education. I'm here tonight to recognize Candy Mastama. Candy, you want to come forward as retiring? Candy has worked for Tiffin City Schools for nine years, both in the Transportation Department and the Food Service Department. Candy's joy is working with kids, and her commitment to this is shown through her dedication to both departments. As a bus aide, Candy always arrives at work with a smile, says hello to everyone in the office before heading out to the bus for duty. She is highly praised in food service for her precision and pride in a job well done correctly. Candy never has an unkind word for anyone, known as a quiet person until you get to know her, 
She can also catch you off guard saying the funniest things. While observing the kids running out to catch the afternoon bus, you'd sometimes hear Candy say, it looks like it's gonna be a fun ride today. <laughs> At the end of a day, you'd sometimes hear Candy say, well, I got an education in the lunchroom today. <laughs> She's been known to demonstrate her cheerleading and dance skills also for her food service colleagues and has an infectious laugh and quick wit. While on the bus route, Candy was responsible for making sure our students were safe, accounted for, and following bus rules at all times. She was not afraid to remind students when they were out of line, but most of the time she was helping students by either gladly answering their questions, playing peacemaker, or mediator, consoling the disheartened, or helping a student gather their belongings before they disembarked the bus to go home. You could always count on her saying good night or have a good night to all of her coworkers as she walked out the door. Candy has been an absolute joy to have working in food service and transportation. She will be missed dearly. I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity of being able to work at Tiffin City Schools. I also want to recognize Norbert Sugar, Nub, retiring from the Transportation Department, I believe after 12 years. He couldn't be here tonight, but we do appreciate all of his years of service. Thank you. Mr. Beeston? Thank you, Mr. Bose. Board of Education, I have two retirements to present the, this evening. Uh, first, we'll call up Connie English. Connie is a proud Tiffin Columbian graduate who has worked in the Tiffin City School District for 21 years as a speech and language pathologist. Before coming to Tiffin City, she worked in private rehab until taking a position at the NCO ESC, where she was placed in Bettsville and New Riggle schools. Throughout her time with Tiffin City, she has worked at Kraut, West Junior High, East Junior High, the current Tiffin Middle School, and Columbian High School. Despite working in all these buildings, Kraut Elementary has always been considered her home school. Some of Connie's fondest memories at Kraut Elementary include the incredible love and support from her coworkers after her husband Chris's death, the many staff celebrations and over-the-top potlucks that have been hosted, the Walk of Fame maze with fully decked out cutouts of staff outside for the ice cream social, the whole school annual sing-alongs before Christmas break, and having her own kids attend the building that she worked in. She also mentioned she will never forget Don Swartz wearing her, her pink V-neck sweater for our breast cancer pink days when he forgot his pink shirt, Garland Fitch wearing a grass skirt and coconut bra for Hawaiian days, and all the times that Chris would tap on the front window to get her attention when he was dropping something off. In retirement, Connie is looking forward to the flexibility to visit her children who live in three states, traveling in general, potentially some volunteer work, possibly doing some part-time speech work, and she may flip another house. She will miss her Kraut family and miss collaborating with the great teachers we have. On behalf of the Kraut 23 staff, I'd like to congratulate Connie English on an amazing career. Not everyone gets to retire from their alma mater, but Connie is, and with great pride. We wish her nothing but happiness and amazing memories in her retirement. Thank you to the board and um, all the staff and everybody. It's been a it's been a good run. So thank you very much. And our last retiree is Kim Orwig. Kim Orwig was born and raised in Tiffin and is a proud 1981 graduate of Columbian High School. She has worked within the Tiffin City School District for 35 and a half years. Her time in Tiffin City started by teaching morning kindergarten at Noble Elementary, followed by morning kindergarten at Noble and afternoon kindergarten at Washington. 
She became a full-time teacher at Crowd Elementary, but due to high enrollment numbers, those kindergarten classes were conducted in the basement of the First Lutheran Church that year. The following year, she was offered a second grade position at Crowd Elementary, where she remained for 32 years, working under 10 different principals. Some of Kim's fondest memories at Kraut Elementary include the ice cream socials, teaching thematic units and sewing bears, heading the party planning committee, and much, much more. She will dearly miss her Kraut family, who she has enjoyed teaching with all these years. To quote Kim, it has been a privilege and an honor teaching primary students and building relationships with them and their families. In her retirement, Kim would like to take a long nap, along with some other undecided activities, which will likely include traveling with her husband, Glenn, and spending time with her friends and family. On behalf of the Kraut 23 staff, I'd like to congratulate Kim on an amazing career to spend her entire 35 plus year career in one school district, which is her alma mater is truly a celebratory achievement. We wish her nothing but happiness and amazing memories in her retirement. Oh, thank you all so much for your, your years of service and all of the, the many lives, not just your children, but the, the family's lives that you've touched and impact. What, what an incredible, um, just an incredible body of work that you, you each represent. So thank you very much. That puts us up to five on the agenda, which is committee reports. And we're starting off with Dr. Gase. Uh, Business Advisory uh, Council did meet on April 27th, I believe. Um, and uh, basically, we're still working on um, uh, problems with work skills and uh, our um, combined uh, sheets and applications for um, future meetings and locations. Uh, I did not, uh, was not able to attend the meeting, but uh, Pat uh, Smith, uh, as she is quite capable, uh, has uh, continued to manage those meetings quite nicely. We have another meeting this Thursday uh, uh, at 8 a.m. It will be at uh, the middle school here. And um, if anyone uh, would like to be involved in the Business Advisory Council, the, feel free to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gase. Uh, Mr. Perez, over to you for finance and then legislation. Okay, we did meet Tuesday and went over the five-year forecast that's on the agenda for this evening. And in that regard, I'm going to defer to Ms. Perry when she presents that to explain the changes in her assumptions and the changes in the forecast. The other issues we did go over were the summer of cash balances and the check register that we normally do as well. And we did look at several uh, levy scenarios as well, but there's no recommendation to do anything at this point with the new superintendent just reviewing everything that's coming out and understanding that we're going to the second year of the biennial uh, year for our legislature and our funding. So that concludes that report and then re legislative liaison part of it. Um, I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Bring us to support services. Support services did not meet. So then that will take us over to Mr. Williams for student achievement and policy. Uh, nothing to report this evening for uh, student achievement, although we did hear quite a bit from the from the high school students. So I don't think I'd want to trump any of that anyway. <laughs> uh, regarding policy and governance, uh, we did meet um, first week of May, and we discussed the uh, policy services offered by uh, both uh, OSBA and Noella, and it's we're not recommending any action at this point. Um, we do have some summaries to provide in the, the committee report, but uh, again, due to the, the cost of those services and kind of where we believe our, our policy manual is at this point, we're, we're not recommending any action. Um, we do think in the future we should continue to look at it, but there's, there's some fairly high ongoing costs associated with some of those services, so we want to defer. Um, we do have some policies to review regarding some of the technology direction from Mr. Weber. And um, we have a social media public or posting guideline that I did not get submitted in time. So we don't have it to review this evening, but we'll, we'll get it out to the board here uh, pretty soon. Thank you. 
That brings us to 5.02, which is superintendent and assistant superintendent's reports. Thank you, Dr. McBride. I have uh, one item tonight for the board uh, for your consideration and pending approval. It's, uh, it's an updated job description for the library uh, media specialist. Um, you know, the library at the high school specifically has changed dramatically over the last few years and not only its appearance, but the services provided there. Technology continues to evolve year in and year out. Uh, and so Mr. Trisler and Mrs. Fote um, looked at the um, job description that we currently have, and it's really outdated, to be quite honest. So what they have done is they have, um, they have used a combination of the old job description uh, with new language from the American Association of School Libraries um, to include in, in, into the new job description. So it's really just an updated job description of the current job and the uniqueness uh, of what Mrs. Fote does in our, our library and, and uh, media center at the high school. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Press. Continuing on uh, with the superintendent report, uh, I'm not going to go over and uh, repeat all of the items that Mr. Trisler uh, shared. We certainly had a great year this year, and I do want to thank all of our students, staff, teachers, and administrators for uh, their efforts this year. Uh, as was stated, there were many challenges um, as we transition out of COVID in the aftermath of the pandemic this year. I think our team did a great job in meeting the needs of our students and making progress in all areas on their educational plans. I do appreciate everyone's help and support in making our graduation for the class of 2022, such a great event this past weekend. Uh, we had to move the event to uh, Sunday due to inclement weather, as was mentioned, but I think it worked out very well. We had a great turnout. I wanna congratulate the class of uh, 2022. In terms of next year, we are in the process of transitioning to our summer programming uh, already. The Budding Genius Program uh, will begin this Thursday. Uh, plans are still being made for the extended learning program uh, that will follow soon after. Um, our last day with students will be this Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Bose is busy uh, continuing to fill a number of vacant positions for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, we have a number of qualified candidates in, uh, in all those various areas that we are, uh, will be interviewing in the near future. Principals have been meeting to organize their schedules for the next school year using the new start time and ending times that were approved by the Board of Education in April. Uh, the school buildings will be shifting their opening times for students to arrive either uh, up or back 15 or 30 minutes, depending upon the building to accommodate the new start times. In meeting with Mr. Conger, the transportation department is finishing up their transition to the new scheduling uh, software program. So they will be starting to develop those new bus routes, uh, I believe Friday at the end of this week. So um, Mr. Conger reports that registration for transportation for next year is underway. And that request uh, that he, have, he has received up to date have been very typical and normal uh, for this time of year. Uh, Mr. Conger continues to try to recruit more bus drivers so that they can service all of the routes that uh, will be planned. So uh, that's my report for this evening. Thank you. When do you expect to have the building opening times for parents for the fall? As soon as we know uh, what the bus routes and what the ridership is gonna be for next year. So that's gonna be probably, we're looking at uh, June or July. Um, Superintendent, I have a question to follow up on the achievements that we heard today with all our students. I've been kind of frustrated because whenever I look at our social media or Instagram pages, whenever we have an athlete or somebody in the high school do something, it's not like immediately out there. We were at a track meet Saturday, had several qualifiers, and it's not on our social media. I think we had one pair of runners at one time. Baseball team advanced. It's it's nowhere. Tennis team finished their season. Nowhere. Um, the same thing with the you know competition teams and other things in businesses. We're just not seeing that. So 
I think if you look at our social pages, you get to see the impression that apparently we have some great schools and then we don't see the rest of our picture. And I think that was one of the comments that came out from the audience previously is um, we're not selling ourselves and these kids do amazing things, but it would help if we were more current and quicker with that. I know the, the other school in town does it pretty actively. And so this isn't a critique, but in terms of SuperNet, what could we do different? What could we do better for next year coming in so that we could address that? And well, I think the district, we've, we've had conversations about that communications director position. And I think we have a position that's been vacant all year uh, in central office that um, has been restructured to primarily handle those communication type duties. Uh, did not get filled this year. I think that's something that needs to be filled going forward because uh, we all realize the importance of communication and uh, how critical that is to uh, a business or a school district, in our case, telling their story. Um, and we all realize that if we're not telling our story, somebody else is telling it for us. And so uh, it's incumbent upon us to be uh, proactive and, and ahead of the curve where we can be and to get those stories out into the community. So uh, we do that, you know, where we can, but... Uh, your point is well taken, and I think the, the answer to that is having somebody in charge of that as, as part of their major responsibilities. Uh, I want to circle back to the busing. So I understand that transportation is building out those routes. My, my question is, when will the, we have the information on each building on when those doors are opening so that parents can plan accordingly? We will have that, you know, as soon as those, uh, as the principals submit their schedules to us and can identify right now we're looking to shift those times uh, either up or back depending upon if the school is opening sooner or later uh, next year uh, to be corresponding to what those times are this year and the plan is to start there and then to see what what type of uh, uh, demand we're going to have in those buildings to have uh, you know, either, either those doors open sooner, probably sooner in most cases. And to see if we have, you know, if the current supervision is gonna be able to handle uh, the number of students. Those are things we're just not gonna know until we have the bus routes in place, uh, our enrollment set. Uh, we don't know what parent schedules are gonna be. We've not been contacted by parents uh, as of yet. We don't know what the uh, local day pro daycare providers schedules are gonna be able to offer yet. So those are details that are important that are gonna to need to be worked out here uh, this summer. I, I think it's very important. I also wanna point out the principals are being very proactive. Um, I know the middle school and the high school has um, devised a plan and the elementary principals, principals also have done the same. Um, we just wanna make sure that all of that is communicated out at the same time. So we will do the very best that we can to get that out in the coming weeks. So, but please understand they are being very proactive and they're doing everything they can. And they just wanna make sure that everything kind of rolls out seamlessly with that communication so that there isn't a miscommunication. So, so, so we have a goal, if I'm understanding, we have a goal to communicate all of this to families because some of those pieces that transportation needs, they can't get until right. parents right. know how to plan. There are some moving pieces that we cannot obviously lay out, but when the buildings will be open, we do know that information. I don't wanna announce it tonight just sure. because I wanna make sure that we have it all together and we put it out and everybody gets the same piece of information. But the principals have been working very diligently on that. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Zeller? That takes us on to 5.03, Director of Operations Report and Recommendations. I, um, I don't have a lot of information. Mr. Daniels um, had an emergency and couldn't be here this evening. Um, so the only thing that I have is letter C, Ohio Summer Food Service Program, which um, in my understanding just needs to be shared at a board meeting that we're offering that program. So I have um, a, a document here to read. All children ages 1 through 18 are eligible to receive free meals during the summer months at participating program sites. Individuals ages 19 through 21 who have been identified as having mental or physical disabilities and are following IEPs, individual education programs, through their current enrollment and educational programs also are eligible for free summer meals. For more information, uh, if you are interested, um, the number is 1-866-3-HUNGRY, 1-866-3-HUNGRY. 
486-4789. This information will also be found online at our webpage. So I wanted to share that tonight. Thank you. So with Mr. Daniels not here, I don't know if Dr. Zoller or Mr. Bose, you can help on the facilities updates. We've had a number of individuals, a number of coaches, a number of um, questions come up about <clears throat> space, about tracks, about tennis courts. Do we have any updates on where these things stand? Mr. Daniel did not present me any information to share tonight. I know, you know, he, he we, the team is, we're, are working on those, uh, you know, issues. Um, you know, the track situation, we've been in communication with uh, the company, um, their attorneys, we're looking to move, you know, forward with the next steps, whatever that may be, um, trying to avoid litigation, um, as that will be costly for both sides. Um, you know, I would expect that to be attended to this summer. Uh, I know part of this was, was waiting till uh, the spring sports season was over, so the track would be available to, uh, you know, to be um, looked at and, and repaired where, where need be. So those things are all in the process of, of uh, you know, moving forward, but I don't have details without Mr. Daniel being here tonight to, uh, to be able to provide uh, tennis. You know, we're not in the process of putting bids out to build a new tennis facility, obviously. So uh, the tennis courts, that situation is going to be uh, needed to be attended to either uh, to, to somehow use our current facility again one more year or to look for an alternative site next year. Those seem to be our options, our only options at this point. Um, so I know that Mr. Daniel is looking into that as well. Thank you. Regarding the tennis courts, though, and I know you're not Mr. Daniels, has the recent like inflation caused any issues regarding the cost of courts at this point, or you have no idea regarding that? And second of all, we just sold the West Junior property, and so now we have that PI money, which we can't use for you know teacher salaries and stuff like that, but we could use that towards something like that, correct? No, oh, absolutely could be if that's you know desired. But have you heard anything about like this now being a bad time to build because of inflation at this point? I think many districts are struggling with that very issue, just construction in general. Um, it's not getting any cheaper, certainly. Um, whether or not that's, you know, that's a driving factor. I mean, I think the need certainly is there at some point. Uh, something's going to need to be done. There's going to be need to be money invested. Um, I think obviously part of the, uh, the challenge has been, you know, looking to try to fold this or incorporate this into a master facilities plan so that, you know, there's a comprehensive focus on all of these facilities and it's not just being attended to in a piecemeal way. So, um, you know, I think the price tag uh, on the estimate for the tennis court stadium, I'll call it a stadium complex, <laughs> um, was higher than what was you know, maybe anticipated at that at that time even, and that was really uh, even before maybe some of the other inflationary um, economics has kicked in. So uh, again, I think right now uh, those things are on pause a little bit, and and again, I think this whole uh, these are things that I think will be better uh, facilitated as the new superintendent comes in and is able to to process them and to uh, to work forward in a planning process next year Se several months ago um, i spoke with uh, bryce coon uh with the uh, tiffin parks and Rex, <clears throat> and he um he told me that uh, it was going to be on their 2023 budget for new tennis courts for the city of tiffin and um i wondered i i mentioned that i'd like to see tiffin city schools uh reach out and uh, combine our efforts to uh, build something that would be um above and beyond either one that could do individually. Uh, has anybody addressed that? Um, I, I, I have not, to my knowledge, I'm not sure if anybody has. Any other questions? Okay. This moves us into item six, which is the opportunity for the public to address the board. Per the board policy, 
Each person addressing the board can, shall give their name and address. If several people wish to speak, each person is allotted three minutes until the total time of 30 minutes is used. During that time period, no person may speak twice until all who desire to speak have had the opportunity to do so. Brian Cooper, 2643 West Township Road, 1177. First, let me start by thanking both the Tiffin City School Board, School Board of Education, and those in attendance for lending your ear tonight. Like I said, my name is Brian Cooper, the husband of longtime Tiffin City School teacher and coach, and inspirer of thousands of our area youth, Amy Cooper. My wife was informed a couple of months ago that her varsity basketball coaching position will not be renewed. It was heartbreaking news for a person with a spotless record as a coach of varsity track for 30 years, JV volleyball, and varsity basketball for the last three years. She was upset, but my first th thoughts, I'll admit, were selfish. I thought, finally, we can take a winter vacation and go somewhere warm, sit on a beach, and hey, I get my wife back. But I quickly realized, as she was hurting, how much coaching basketball meant to her and how hard she has worked to make everything as good as possible for these girls. She has been involved in basketball in one way or another for as long as I can remember. I want to get right to the point. I, along with many others, do not feel Amy was given a fair shot by our AD, Dan Hartzell, when he told her he was not renewing her contract for next season. He was taking the program in a, new, in a new direction is what he shared. I know being an AD is one of the toughest jobs out there. I have friends who are in that spot. It's not easy. And Dan and I have always got along well, so I will not act like I can fill his shoes. But everything about this felt wrong. I am not going to stand up here and bash Mr. Hartzell, but instead I will focus on Tiffin City School's surprising loss, a person who loves to coach volleyball, track, and basketball. If I had to bet, basketball is her favorite. She says to me that they're all equal. In a time where employers are struggling to find employees, and we all know that teachers and coaches are some of the most underpaid people out there. And you have a coach that has committed herself to the community, to the school system, and to these girls. Amy and I aren't going anywhere. We love Tiffin. And we love Tiffin City Schools. She went to school here. She set records here and has coached here for 30 years. She was recently inducted into TC's Hall of Fame. She serves on boards and never misses an athletic boosters meeting as a coach, which means she goes to those meetings voluntarily. Amy has me get the house ready every year for the annual girls basketball Christmas party, which is a tradition that Amy has kept alive. She runs summer league basketball, which by the way, may not be happening this year because of Amy's forced departure. Many area coaches have been reaching out to her about the league but she has responsibly not discussed the topic, and yet several TC students were told about the non-renewing of her contract shortly after it happened, and asked Amy about it before she even shared the news with our own daughters. How does that happen? She also now, alongside Mr. Koch, successfully runs Tiffin's largest sporting event in the Cross Country Carnival. That event does miraculous things for our economy, and it was put in the hands of someone that is trusted. She has left kids with countless athletic skills and even more importantly, with great memories. I'm at a loss, Tiffin City Schools. Is this someone that you really wanna lose? Is your girls varsity basketball coach? It's easy to be a coach when you have all the pieces that make winning easy. But your real test on just how good of a coach you guys have is one that handles those down years where you're developing young talent and just maybe all the pieces of that winning puzzle aren't there yet. It happens in all sports. 
Coach Ken had seven wins, two wins, and three wins in his first three years as the boys varsity basketball coach. He's still here, and he's doing great. And yes, you have some parents sometimes that get upset when their team is not winning, or they feel their daughter is not getting the playing time they deserve. In fact, one of those parents has already pulled his daughter out of Tiffin City Schools, put her in another area school with the announcement, even with the announcement of Tiffin City Schools looking for a new girls basketball coach. Where was the dedication there? Was it really about the coach at that point? I'm a father of two girls who played sports. I understand that feeling, but I respected the coach's decision, whomever they were, and an AD should not bow to the pressures of those few parents that scream loudest. Larry had those years. Amy's dad was one of the parents doing the yelling. But Larry had good support, and he built an incredible program over the years. Amy was his assistant coach for some of those years. She makes the sport not just about competition, but about commitment, about teamwork, and about having fun, about smiles and memories, and not hating practice every day, even on those down years. And given the opportunity, she would have brought some more of those good winning years back to TC girls basketball. From what I understand, Mr. Hartzell's new direction is a 22-year-old with no coaching experience. Please do not take that as I am criticizing her. I'm not. I wish her all the success as I do all TC sports. We all have to start our careers at some point, but I was somewhat baffled by the new direction. There are so many ways to address this topic, but Amy has very carefully and respectfully followed the chain of command she has met with her union rep, met with Columbian principal, Mr. Trisler, and met with the superintendent, Dr. Zoller, and the assistant superintendent, Mr. Bowes. All of, these, all of the issues that make this wrong are well documented by Amy, along with the support she received along the way in compiling all of these notes. I asked Amy for these so I could read and reread them and summarize them and then share them tonight with you all. But then I thought about it, and I do not believe in this public forum behind this podium that this is the place to read these. I do not want to partake in public bashing. I am instead asking the board, now that you are officially aware, to review this information. Look at the hard facts, the testimonies, and some of the issues you may, may not be aware of over the last three years. Please discuss them. Then meet with Amy, Dan, and render whatever decision you feel appropriate. I leave you with this. But should an AD that has recently said he will leave here as soon as he gets a chance, and both a principal and a superintendent that are moving on, both of whom I respect, be making the decision on whether a woman that has dedicated her life to Tiffin City Schools, both as a teacher and a coach, stays or not? I, along with so many others, think not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Any other members of the public? Madam President, if no one else is going to speak, I do have an email that a parent asked me to share with the board. She sent it to the board, but she asked if we can share it at the meeting today. Um, I don't have my reading glasses. You want me to try to read it or? Uh, we received an email from an Aaron Bowles. I'm going to read this um, as it is written. I just want to take a moment to let you know how wonderful all the staff at the Tornado Academy is. They take time out of their schedule at all hours to help students succeed. They go above and beyond. They make kids feel welcome, which is huge for a lot of these kids that feel very pushed out of the schools due to bullying and other issues. I cannot say enough good things about the whole staff. They work so well as a team and they communicate well. If there are questions, they take time to answer them and they respond very quickly and kindly. These teachers and administrators are a breath of fresh air to our public school experience. I don't think they get the recognition they deserve. I would like to speak, but I don't really want to walk to the podium. <laughs> Jennifer Kuhn, 191 Lindsay Avenue, Tiffin, Ohio. 
Um, I just really want to express my gratitude to the entire staff of Tiffin City Schools, um, our tech department, our maintenance, our grounds, our aides, our bus drivers, our teachers, our uh, kitchen staff, our secretarial staff. I'm sure I'm probably forgetting some, including our principals and our administrators. Um, we have been through tough years. Um, but as a team, we continue to strive and move forward. And I just really want to thank everyone for everything that they've done up to this point and everything they will continue to do. Um, we are TC and we believe in what we do. And we thank the board for what you're trying to do in making the next decision. And we really look forward to finding out that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? That will bring us to the consent agenda, which is um, seven, item seven. So we have approved the minutes from the April regular and special and May board meetings. Um, there are a number there. Uh, approve the treasurer's report for April 7.02. 7.03 is employment. Um, under employment is the contract that was just brought up regarding non-renewal. Um, trying to find the next one. 7.04 is donations and grants. 7.05 is stipends. 7.06, certificate of fiscal officer. Do I have a motion? Does anybody want to um, pull 7.03 out for discussion? I'll make a motion. What's your motion, Dr. Gates? I'll just make a motion um, to approve. To approve the consent yeah. agenda? Do we have a second? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So since the addendum is also 703, does that get included? It does. So if we, if we would like to discuss just okay. that or have some pieces, we need to pull that out. So, Dr. Gase, you're... I just um, made a motion so we can talk about it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So with a second, we can discuss it. Second. Any discussion? So I, I know there's some sense of urgency. I believe uh, we did receive an email from the athlete's parent. Uh, regarding a um, delay in off-season training for the for the girls' basketball program, um, I haven't spoken with the um, athletic director, uh, so I don't really know much about the uh, the issue at hand. Um, does anybody have any other input? I, since it's on the consent agenda, just needs one member not to agree to put it on there if you don't feel comfortable with it and want it out for further discussion or is that what he's asking for so yes so if someone if anyone is uncomfortable with 7.03 being a part of consent agenda we can pull that out we can vote on the rest of the consent agenda and then we can discuss 7.03 i think that's fine i i have i think it's a good idea let's let's get the other uh issues uh, on the consent agenda approved Okay. Yeah. So, Mrs. Perry, what does that need to look like? So you would be modifying the agenda because right now it's part of 7.03, which is part of the consent agenda, which just requires one vote. So I believe we would need a motion to remove it from the consent agenda um, with a second and then a roll call vote to do that. Mm -hmm. And then we can go back and vote on the consent agenda because we already have that motion in second. Make sense? Yep. So we need a motion to remove 7.03 or just that item. Just that item because 7.03 is all those. That's a lot of other. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we need a, a motion and a second if there is one to remove the the addendum essentially. Can, can I make the motion just to approve or do I have to make a motion to remove it and then a motion to approve? Right. Okay. So uh, I make a motion to remove some the specific uh to remove the addendum. Yes. addendum yeah. Do we have a second? Uh, I think it's worth a little bit of discussion. Yeah. Sure. Mrs. Perry. 
Sorry, second. Okay. Dr. Case. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Mr. Perez. Dr. McBride. Yes. So now we need to go back and approve the consent agenda. Correct. So we just need to vote on that because we've already had a motion and a second. All right. Mrs. Perry. Dr. Case. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. So now we'll enter in a discussion regarding the addendum that was presented, which is the, the non-renewal of the head, head varsity basketball coach, Mrs. Cooper. And your question was, what information do we know or what do we not yeah, know? Yeah, I mean, did, uh, did, uh, did Dan speak with the uh, superintendent or assistant superintendent? Any, uh, any insight? We did have a meeting, um, as was indicated. I did meet with, uh, with Amy and uh, with, with uh, Mrs. Joyce, uh, along with Mr. Bose. So we did have a meeting and they presented information. We um, met with Mr. Trisler and, and Mr. Um, Hartzell, uh, Mr. Bose and I did. And, um, you know, I'm, so we got, I guess, both, both sides of the story. Their recommendation is to, uh, to, to go with a different, uh, to go in a different direction with head girls basketball coach going forward um, based on the status of the program, uh, where we are after uh, three years and the development and the direction that they, they felt like uh, it was going. Also had a uh, meeting with uh, at least one parent. I know Mrs. McBride was part of that meeting um, as well uh, of girls basketball uh, player um so yeah i mean we've we've had some meetings we had had some information uh this is the recommendation of the athletic director and high school principal i just had one i just had one question um the different direction um was that like uh discussed a year ago or two years ago or was there any discussion about remediation or some type of change that was expected from the coach? Well, I wasn't here two years ago. Um, well, I mean, did anybody bring it up? Did, did Dan bring it up that there was a discussion about different direction? What is that different direction? I guess that's what I would I'd like to know. I, I don't recall there being a, a remediation. Well, I mean, yeah, just a you know, suggestion. Like I know with other coaches, we've, we've set, uh, Dan had set them down and, and said, mm -hmm. hey, uh, we don't like this part of the direction the program's taking. Um, we'd like to see some improvement in this area uh, or give us your proposal, how you're gonna change it. And I just wanna know if that kind of thing was done or if this was just, um, cause it, you know, it just appears as though maybe it was sprung at us. That's the appearance I get. I don't, and, and that's why I, I just like to know. Yeah, some, similar question, so we've, we've this isn't the first um, slew of emails or parent phone calls we've had regarding the non-renewal, the job posting process, especially around coaches. And again, I don't, I, I, I echo what Mr. Cooper says. I don't envy that that role. I'm not an AD, nor have I ever been. Um, but there, there do seem to be some concerning pieces, or at least some questions that I have around the policy or the protocol. What's the evaluation system look like? Are we looking at records? Are we? when is a coach given an evaluation? Are they given time to improve? Like, what does this look like? Because I, I I just did some quick looking at, at records and it looks like the, the records are fairly similar of coaches who were kept versus not kept. So I'm I'm wondering what there's other pieces are or how um, our employees are, are given the opportunity to address those concerns. Um, if we want a new direction is a coach who's been in that position and has those established relationships given the opportunity to to do that can you speak to what the protocol is or the policy or the process or any of that well um again i i think that uh you know these these contracts are all one year they're they're um all of our supplementals are non-renewed at the end of one year there's an evaluation process that goes uh, on uh in talking with, uh, you know, Mrs. Cooper, uh, I would say that there appears, you know, I mean, there appears to be some inconsistencies um, 
about the evaluation process in general. Um, that that I think uh, you know are are a factor in this in this uh, I guess question. Again, I am I am bringing forward the recommendation of the athletic director and high school principal. Um, having met with them after our meeting, they they felt like this was uh, the direction that they wanted to maintain going. And uh, if, if this is something you'd like me to look into further and review further, I, I'm certainly willing to do that. As, as uh, was mentioned uh, by Dr. Gase, certainly we are getting here uh, at the end of the school year and it's, it's almost ready to, for summer uh, programming to start and the like. And, and so there is an essence of time that uh, we're backed up against. But um, I mean, certainly I think we can, we can look at those options. I, I think in consideration to uh, the present board, I think I'd appreciate that given the um, exodus of uh, our superintendent and principal uh, and reported uh, consideration for exit exiting of the athletic director. I've not heard of that, but um, yeah, it does put the onus on us, doesn't it? I mean, we're gonna be left uh, holding the bag, so to speak. Well, I'm concerned that, that a recommendation was brought forward when there's an awareness of inconsistencies about evaluation. So it sounds like you recognize that and this evaluate this this recommendation was still brought forward. Um, so I, I have distinct concerns around that. So if there are inconsistencies or there's any issues in the evaluation process on which determinations are made or recommendations are given, if there's an issue with those that's noted, I, I think those need to be explored. And I have grave concerns as to why any students would be aware of any personnel issues prior to that being shared or voted upon or any of those pieces. Um, those are my current concerns. I've tried to stay as far away from this as possible um, because Amy and I go back to 1993 when she was Amy Shar. Amy Shar and Brian Cooper both were in my geometry class and uh, now they're man and wife. Um, I've gone to some of the basketball games. I've not gone to a lot of them. I've sat by myself because I don't want to in any way be involved with any of the processes. Um, the, I, I know there was a concern with individual growth of talent and players. Uh, one thing I've talked to, to uh, Amy about and Brian is that the age of a coach coaching three seasons in a row makes you a dinosaur. It is extremely hard to do. Uh, Brian made one comment. He said, geez, I was kind of happy. She'd be home in the wintertime. Uh, he changed that tune, but he did mention that. I can also tell you from being a former coach that basketball is a year-around sport. Uh, you've got everything. Summer league has been going on since, I think, around 1992. I don't think it's ever missed a year. That takes a lot of time. You've got weight room. You've got open gyms, you've got team camps, all these things. And I don't know, and I purposely don't know, whether we are continuing to do these things, because I know Amy's also in volleyball, which is a year-round sport. Uh, track is not, although the pole vaulters are working year-round. So it is very, very tough to be a three-sport uh, three coach in today's society. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to say that regarding Ms. Cooper, uh, none of this has to do anything with her ability as a teacher. And I think we're proud of her as an educator, and none of this should be meant to reflect in that way, which is, I think, why my concern with the process has been that apparently this has been going through students and staff before it ever came to the board, and I don't think that's very professional in that regard, that our employees are entitled to that. Um, I think we heard that the decision was made months ago, and yet it's just coming to us before the season basically starts. And we've seen this before. We saw it with, with baseball as well, where we posted, reposted. The students had to get together, 
put pressure on to somebody to hire a coach. And we ended up hiring him, I think in February, the evaluation process, we've had that come up before. And so the concerns I have, what is going on administratively that we can't run this process that we have coaches in place before season start and that decisions are made early on. Um, we're bored. We don't make HR decisions. We respect what the superintendent recommends going through his principal and his AD. Um, but, this is now twice in one year now that this has happened. And so I looked over the agenda and I think we have one soccer coach for the fall already. I didn't see the other one on there. And so I don't want to start off with the first year where I was here where we're hiring football coaches after the season started and then having to explain, well, maybe they didn't complete back. Maybe they didn't do this, but it's like, it's, it's your job to do that, to get these things done so that you can present it to the board so that we can, you know, just have all our answers, you know, questions answered and we're not facing questions like this. So uh, again, that's the only thing I ask is that we be presented with this in a timely and regular manner following the same procedure for everyone. I've, got, I've also served as the athletic director. Uh, I can tell you that in my 35 years, I counted, I think we've had 15 athletic directors. So the average is just over two years for each athletic director because the athletic directorship at Tiffin City Schools is too big for one person. It has been, when I first came to the district in 1983, we had two athletic directors. We then went to one and a half, and then we went to one, and we've been with one for at least, well, up until a year or two ago when we brought in an assistant to do the junior high. In that time, we've also added, uh, Four teams playing football. One of them now, TU, goes uh, elsewhere. We have lacrosse, and we have uh, uh, Tiffin University soccer and our own soccer on our field. I can also tell you from experience that I was called in Boston, Massachusetts to schedule TU's band on the football field during a vacation. That's what the athletic director does. The athletic director also should have a year-end report from every coach, those should be evaluated every year. I don't know if that's going on. I know it did when I was the AD for the one year. We used to have an athletic council to oversee some of these things. I don't think that's going on now. The athletic department has been overlooked for a number of years. Uh, it's understaffed, and that's part of the problem, I think, with timing. I think I would echo the uh, maybe frustration that it's possible that students have information and are communicating with a coach prior to us having that information. And I think even hearing Mr. Cooper's comments, it, it sounds as though there's information out about who may be a front runner for the position that has technically not yet been vacated. So, I mean, th these are all, these are all a little bit disappointing. Um, a, we're, we certainly have, I think, received more comments from parents than we have from the administration about the issue, which it, it's it's hard to make a decision based on feedback from, from parents and community members because um, we're going to get equal comments, uh, pros and cons. All right. We're receiving comments of support, right? And we're receiving comments of, of not support. So it's, it's very challenging, I think. We're, we're being asked to make a decision um, to support a new direction, but don't have information on what the new direction is. That's a, that's a very tough position for us to be in. I think what we do know right now is that the, the basketball program, the girls basketball program is operating without a direction. We have someone who believes they will not be asked to come back to coach, but we don't have anybody who's taking direction over the program right now it's it's in a bit of a, a floundering state we have parents asking when are open gyms like as, as board members we certainly can't answer those questions um I, so i mean these are all things outside of the recommendation to not renew the contract but don't renew the contract in favor of a new direction or a different direction but that's a big it's a bit of a a, a vacuum of information around the new direction um it's... I, I have all those same questions. I also try to 
really mind the line of like our role is not to do day-to-day -day operations. Our role is not to do the AD's job. Um, that's not our role. That's not our job. My concern is the piece around the policy and the protocol, and those do fall under our purview. And my concern is around the statement that there are inconsistencies about the evaluation process, that we were aware of those, and that this recommendation is still brought to this board. Therein lies my concern. I do not feel comfortable with, with those components. My job is not to be a high school principal. My job is to trust and respect all the people we put in place. But it does sound as though there were flaws in this process that weren't attended to and the re recommendation was still brought forward. Ms. Perry, am I wrong, but since it's a recommendation of the superintendent not to renew that we would need actually four votes by the board to actually override that? I don't know that off the top of my head. I apologize. I, I think I've read that since it was a recommendation and that we would be hiring someone you didn't recommend, we'd need four, not just a quorum of the board to do it. I would ask, I know we're meeting tomorrow. I don't know if it's short notice because I think I'd like to discuss some of these elements with an executive session. So. If, if it's a possibility, I'll just pull the recommendation. Is that a possibility, Mrs. Perry? It's been removed from the consent agenda. So it would take board action to put it back on the agenda. Do we meet in executive session tomorrow? Oh, uh, for, t for are tomorrow. We, um, are we able to adjust that agenda? We did not publicize that as a reason for meeting. Right. Um, and we have to do that within 24 hours. So it would be too late to do that now. We have to meet the we got to meet sometime to do a contract with you. So is it possible for us to table this until there is further discussion, further explanation? We're gonna likely have to have a special board meeting to address a superintendent contract coming soon. Can we discuss this then? Can will that give administration enough time to go back and explore and come back with some more answers? Does that is that a possibility? I'm not even certain is this Dr. Zoller or Sharon. It's already been removed right, on but, tonight's agenda. Okay. But we want to have some kind of decision made. I mean, it's, can't yeah, really so I, I think the suggestion is we we are going to have to well, we're meeting tomorrow yeah. for interviews. We will we have to meet again in, in the next right? few days to discuss yeah, contracts. I'd like to have yeah. Mr. Hartzell probably be the person that we yeah. need to talk to. So we can invite him into not tomorrow night because it wasn't posted for that, but the next special board right. meeting. Yeah, I think we need to speak with Mr. Hartz. Because it's been removed from the agenda, so there's no voting yeah. on it currently. Right, Mrs. Perry? I believe, unless, Mr. Perez, you have a concern that... No, we're not voting on it. Right, if we were voting on it oh. to override the recommendation, we yeah. would need okay. a four to retain her despite his recommendation. Yeah, really and I think part of the executive would be to see if we could have I, counsel available as I well. think that only applies to teachers. So since it has been removed, um, it, it can stay removed without being voted on, and we can then, not tomorrow, we don't have enough time to notice that to the public, but for our next special board meeting, we can invite in Mr. Hartzell or union reps or Mrs. Cooper, whoever, um, to be able to get a further understanding, correct? Mrs. Spar, I'm gonna ask you what um, the reason for meeting tomorrow night, what, what reason was publicized? Employment. Do you, if it was the employment of a public employee, singular, then that would limit us. Well, either way, we're going to be having a meeting pretty soon. Yeah. Right, so the last one. While she's looking that up, there is a sense of urgency. Yeah. in this matter because right. team camps are filling up and documentation has to get out, weight training, et cetera. So in those pieces, when we are in the absence of a, a coach or a named coach, I mean, we've had numbers of searches happening. Is it then the AD's role to then run those? What does that look like? Yes. Okay. The AD makes the recommendation, principal makes the recommendation, superintendent does, it comes to us. 
but uh, the AD is the one that does the interviewing for coaches. But in the in the interim, because there's probably times where we don't have one or the other in transition, the AD then would run those camps or make sure the students are getting registered in those pieces. Mr. Tristan now, is saying yes, so I'm looking at me. Generally, a JV coach would take care of that. Okay, so we have options, uh, but there is a sense of urgency. Do we have a JV coach? Generally, when you change head coaches, uh, you would let them bring in their own staff. I will note that this school was in on uh, March 18th. We made a recommendation shortly after March 18th. Hey, this is just now getting to me. So. I feel like we've done due diligence, but I didn't feel like it was the best decision for us to make at the high school. Uh, all the school board probably would have recommended it. Uh, you know, uh, this is two degrees of good role model for women. I feel like we're making it to the time level, and I feel like we just missing an opportunity. I'm not saying that I, it's not my role to disagree on personnel or those pieces, but there is a, a policy protocol concern here that I, has been, has been noted. So I think that those need to be explored before we can move forward. There's, there's two sides to every story. You know, in, in theory, we don't know a coach any explanation as to whether to pick up their option or not. Uh, my first year, my second year on the job, let a wrestling coach know he was not going to take the next role. Um, our policy does not state that they need to be given Mr. Kismet, when he was in the room, would give an evaluation. Uh, she was given a chance to have an evaluation. The association did not agree with that as part of the process. Um, in hindsight, it would be better just to let her I think our athletic director um, went above and beyond with his job. Above and beyond in trying to sit down and explain where he felt we were in the program. Fully support that. Uh, not that I'm, being, I'm moving in a different direction too. Though. <laughs> yep, we have a lot of leadership change going on. And so I also think that, you know, it, it, probably an executive session is a better place to discuss some of these things, especially considering some of the pieces around how do students know what the policy and protocol is. And, you know, if this is what we've done for X amount of years, doesn't make it the right way to do it. So I think that those are some pieces that is best to be discussed in executive session. Mrs. Perry. Mrs. Spark confirmed that based on the notice that we publicized for tomorrow night, we would not be able to discuss this matter. So I do think that we will have a, another special board meeting that will probably have to be set um, likely after tomorrow. So still quickly. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get this piece on that agenda. Um, I'm gonna look at my board members. That sound all right. It'll add a piece to it. So then, Mrs. Perry, are we good to move on to the to action items? Yes. All right. So this takes us to 8.01, approved staff handbooks. These are, um, these were presented last month for a first read. It's just all the staff handbooks for elementary, middle school, high school um, buildings. Uh, I believe the changes were um, cosmetic in nature, just mostly dates for next year. Entertain a motion. So move. Thank you. Second by Perez. Any discussion? Uh, is there any um, items in those handbooks regarding school start times? I don't believe they are at this time because of the fact we weren't aware 
and sure of what that was going to look like quite yet. Okay, so we'll have an, another update uh, at some point in the near future to approve? If we choose to add them in there, we could revise them again. Yeah. That's going to come up in the next next item. Any other discussion? Mrs. Perry. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.02 approve Colombian parent student handbooks. Actually, 8.02 and 8.03 are reflective of the changes made last month when it comes to, uh, in terms of year long courses being changed to semester courses. I don't believe start times are included in this change. So again, we could have a revision as soon as those times come out. That revision, that revision will be on page three of the parent student handbook. It still shows the original times. So then we'll still have an, another revision to address here in a few weeks. Yeah, we could, yes. Entertain a motion. Can we get a motion? Entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you. Any other discussion? The only discussion is, so we're proving it with the idea that we're going to amend it. So should we just, you need the new book out or should we just wait till it's amended and we're approving it once? We could probably table it. Okay. And, and put the um, revised start times uh, in the June board meeting and just do it all at one time. What? Yes. I'm not sure if we still print those. So. We can we can table it until June. So do we need to table eight point zero three as well or just eight point zero two? We would need a motion to table eight point zero two. No one's moved on eight point zero three. Um so I believe that recommendation can just be removed by the administration, but eight point zero two will require a motion and a second and a vote to remove it. <laughs> We're learning lots tonight. At that. So, Mr. Bose, do you, so 8.02, we need to table. So yes. We, all right. So we need a, a motion and a second to table. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thanks. Mrs. Perry. Mr. Perez. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Mr. Rose, do you want 8.03 on there? Or does that not have start times in it so we can move forward with it? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rescind what I said. Since you've already adopted the agenda with this recommendation on it, I think you do need to do a motion to table it. Okay. Sorry well, about that. I think we only need to table it if there's start times in it. If there's not, then we don't need to, correct? Yes, that would be correct. And I'm not sure if it has the start times in it, which I don't I don't think the curriculum think guide would have that and it's that critical. So we can probably approve this one. Yep. I will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Perez. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.04 approved school nurse agreement. It's just an annual renewal um, with <clears throat> Mercy Health Hospital for uh, to provide services for our, our district wide school nurse. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Dr. Gase, you're abstaining? Say what? Are you abstaining on this yeah. one? Yeah. Okay. You don't still hmm. no. Any other discussion? All right. Mrs. Perry. 
Mr. Perez. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. Gase. Abstain. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.05, approve the Mental Health Recovery Services Board contract. Yep, this uh, contract provides mental health care services for the district. Um, recommending we continue that program. Entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you. And then it was there a second? No. I'll second it. Thank you, Mrs. Perry. And then for discussion, this is the annual grant, right? Or correct? Uh, oh, no, yeah. discussion. discussion. We're down to 44,000 this year, correct? Last year, do you recall what the allocation was at 80 or 70? How much? 59? Um, so with that continuing to diminish and we have a two, is it two years on our SR funds? Is that where we are? So are there, I don't, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering like, do we, have we had discussions around a light item regarding social emotional health? Do we have plans for sustainability as these funds continue to decrease? Are we allocating funds? each year so that when these dollars go away, we can continue serving student needs. Do we know where these discussions are? I'd like to express my thanks to the board at the Mental Health and Service Recovery Services Board of our multiple counties for awarding us this grant again. I think ultimately we're supposed to become sustainable, and I think that's why we had those discussions about trying to steer people towards Medicaid so we can try to get those people on Medicaid that can do so, so that would free up some of the grant money. But I guess, you know, we're still getting a bigger need and running, a, you know, have to find a revenue source for it. And I Absolutely. I, I think we have a phenomenal board, the phenomenal director who has always been a huge champion of the district. I do think that we need to, in earnest, look forward at how we are going to sustain this. Uh, the projections after and during the pandemic are that we haven't seen the peak of need and that we're not going to see the peak for another five years. The need is only going to increase. And while our business is education, um, without that foundational piece of social emotional healthy, you, you can't learn. Um, so I, I do think that we need to continue the discussions around how are we going to be building this into the budget once some of these dollars uh, continue to dissipate. Uh, Sharon, not to put you on the spot, but we were supposed to, um, when we got a social worker that we specifically went after a social worker to let we could do some billing of Medicaid. Are, are we having any success with that? Billing for services for social? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Um, but we could build under a, a Medicaid code for social services as long as we have a licensed social social worker. Some, and as long as they open up. 
Yeah, right. are, are you referring to a social worker added to our staff? No, I mean, for like the services that Ms. Ms. Miller is uh, providing. There are some she, that, okay, so she is a contracted that. service. So because well, that of, goes to the ESC then? Yeah, then? because it's federal funding, um, we always have to have three quotes for a contracted service. If it reaches a certain threshold, then we need to do a request for proposal. So, so if I that wasn't if she's doing done, the then service we can't. for us, does the ESC do the billing then? So she not that I'm aware of. Because it's 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 that state funding, not Fed, since the, the Medicaid. And it depends on what she's it, doing. It's considered she's... federal. The auditors look at it as federal funding, and then they require Medicaid? they no. require the federal procurement. Well, the yes. federal the Feds give the state money. The state decides how to spend Medicaid money. The Medicaid auditors consider it federal money, and they risk, they expect federal procurement regulations to be followed. I understand that it flows through the state of Ohio, but they still require federal. So procurement. I guess what, I, I, what I'm saying is that we we're not getting any correct billable services. Correct. I, can I speak about something I learned about today? So I attended our counselors meeting today, and one of the things that we talked about was Medicaid billing, um, and trying to make sure that we had a, an understanding of how that kind of works. So with Medicaid billing, um, basically, essentially, what they're doing is they require families to um, complete a process. So if they're Medicaid eligible, they have to fill out all of this paperwork. If they're not Medicaid eligible, um, services are delivered, but without that track of all that paperwork. So in a sense, it almost becomes discriminatory in that we require an additional um, amount of work and, um, and just a flow to get the services provided so that we can, in fact, um, provide services to, to all students. Um, and with that Medicaid helping to offset the cost for our students who do not receive Medicaid services is my understanding of it. Is that correct, Michelle? Yes, you can continue to articulate that as well. So if we It adds an extra barrier, so it, it, it's, it's very well intended, but then while a child, so you, you provide services in the school because it removes barriers. You, they're there, it, you don't have the transportation pieces, you don't have to um, have somebody get there, there's a cost piece, you know, there's all of these pieces that school removes the barrier of, but then when you have to open up as a, uh, do a full DA, then you have to, a parent or guardian has to come in, they have to do all of this paperwork all of the while while you're trying to do these pieces, or we have a staff member who's going out to homes after hours or before hours, the child is not getting services in that time. Whereas if you're a child without Medicaid, you start services as soon as requested or referred. Right, Michelle? And to Mr. Chair's point, only 44,000 jobs that would be eligible because the rest of the so I think all of these pieces highlight how there's, I think the district has done a, done a great job of putting together various revenue streams, but I do think it needs to be an ongoing conversation because they, there isn't a definite amount of time. These, these funds will stop and our funds from the board will continue to decrease. So I think that we 
uh, in conjunction with our treasurer and our, our superintendent, we need to be looking at how do we build this in so that as those funds decrease, we're not having to decrease services to our students, which I believe all the trend lines and Mrs. Miller when she was here showed that our needs are only going up. So if we're not we're not meeting that or matching that, then we're I think we're doing a disservice if we're not planning ahead. No, I think I have two concerns with what was said. One is I think if they're professional and they're licensed, there'll be fidelity to that client, whether they're Medicaid or not. Um, they get to build different rates, which one is more, you know, one is more favorable if you're the one billing. But the other thing is Medicaid is not that hard to apply for. We do it at our agency. It's been, you know, made easier to apply for it, opens up other benefits for health and stuff like that. But I heard that like parents are an obstacle and I get concerned when I hear that, that this is a way of getting around parents knowing that kids are in counseling or something. And as a parent, I would want to make sure that they're involved. So those are two separate things. I know. And that's what I wanted those to make are, sure that's are, what I'm hearing. So. so that it's not saying not letting parents know parents have to sign consent. Okay. Those, those are two that's very what I want to make things. sure. But if I, depending on when I work or my availability to get to the district to fill out paperwork or my availability for a computer for final forms or having a school personnel go out at seven in the morning or eight at night to a home, like those are some of the barriers, not uh, obstructing parents' awareness. Or well, thank you for clarifying that. There has to be consent. Yeah, and, and no one is saying parents are a barrier. Uh, parents are not a barrier. It is the paperwork and all of those different kinds of things that require us to do all of that that becomes a barrier. Point that last year, administration wanted us to force to hand parents and possibly take an SRO or JFS for their own assignment to be delivered. We have to understand that many of our parents have their own trauma that they deal with, and so just educating them and removing those barriers is exactly what we want to do. Any other discussion on this piece? Mrs. Perry. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.06, approve Hegarty Literacy Curriculum Price Quote. This is a literacy curriculum that uh, we currently use for pre-K, kindergarten, and uh, elementary schools. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Are we approving a quote or a purchase? It is not curriculum we are currently using. It is curriculum that we are using starting next year. So you are approving the purchase of so yes, you are approving the curriculum, but you're approving the purchase of the curriculum for next year. This is re replacing something then? No. Um, in regards to the dyslexia laws and knowing what um, is being said in regards to literacy, we are trying to be proactive and we are trying to put supports in place to address students' needs. Therefore, we have done um, a lot of uh, research this year. We're working with our literacy um, committee and this is one of the programs that they had decided to move forward with and we will be implementing pre-K to three starting next year and then also expanding out from that. Ms. Kim, who headed up that, that process of doing that, that research? Um, we have Amber Mills, who she is our literacy consultant from the North Central Ohio Educational Service Center. Um, she also worked in conjunction with myself. And then we had building representatives um, from Washington, Kraut, and Noble. Um, and then as we met as the district leadership team, uh, preschool is part of the district leadership team. And so they also came into that conversation and that decision to move forward, instituting it with pre-K up through five. So just a, a quick thank you to that entire team. Um, if following the, the legislation and, and the news out there and also listening to our parents in the district, the, the dyslexia of peace being proactive about that and putting it um, in place uh, ahead of time, uh, I think is a, a great step. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'm sorry, who made that motion? Do we move? Dustin? Gase. I, Gase? Dr. Gase, thank you. Somebody? Dustin seconded it. Yep, I got that part. Um, Mrs. Perry? Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Kizabeth? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. 
8.07, approve Apex Learning subscription. This is a renewal for uh, credit recovery curriculum that we currently use for high school students. Thank you. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Wonderful. Mrs. Perry. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.08, .08, approved JB roofing proposal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? My only concern when I look at the, the quotes and so forth is they're only guaranteeing it from anywhere from two to five years. Uh, I understand a flat roof is a pain in the backside, but it seems like that's a small guarantee for that kind of expenditure, but I have no idea. So just a comment. Scotty's not here, but I think last time he talked about it, just like they're sealing it. So they're not replacing the roof and it's only going to be three to five years if we're lucky. So ultimately we'd have to make a decision unless you wanted to re-roof them all. Okay, thank you. It didn't say anything about a guarantee. It just said expectancy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we, you know, <laughs> I saw Walt uh, over the weekend and, uh, you know, when Mr. Martin was here, we had our own cruise and we did, a, that was every year, right? I mean, every year they're up on the roof doing some repairs. I don't remember. Yeah. I just remember the yeah. one. They did. It was pretty much every the one year when the roof came off of Columbian High School in a storm landed on a employee's car. Mm. <laughs> never, never a dull day. No, they did that at Noble last year during, which was kind of, they had them up at the beginning of the school year. That's the only thing. And so it's just a sealant. So it's not a repair. So. Uh, Mrs. Perry. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.09, approve the revised teacher librarian, library media specialist job description. This will move. Second. <laughs> this is what Mr. Bose talked about earlier. Any other discussion? Mrs. Perry. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.09. 11 renew administrator contracts. These administrator contracts are currently up for renewal. Um, all of them have, have uh, qualified for what they're being recommended for, and we appreciate their service to the district. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry. Mr. Perez. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.12, approve updated five-year forecast and assumptions. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Is there anything, Mrs. Perry, you'd like to walk us through on these? I apologize that I was not able to prepare a formal presentation for tonight um, due to a death in my family, but um, th this was um, reviewed at the Finance Committee last week um, in, in great detail. Um, you do have the forecast and the assumptions or explanations um, exhibited back on pages 101 through about 110. Um, one thing that I want to point out that we decided to do at finance was we removed the capital improvements reservation on line 902. So that in essence added $3,750,000 back into the ending balance um, on June 30th, 2026. Um, I went through all revenue lines and expenditure lines and adjusted everything for um, actual um, fiscal year to date figures. So total revenues decreased $1.6 million, unfortunately, over the five years um, in the forecast. Expenditures decreased $810,000. Um, we removed the annual capital improvements reservation, as I mentioned. So all of those adjustments resulted in a $2.9 million increase to the unreserved fund balance on 6-30-26.
So that is now forecasted to total $4,252,259. Um, that is the equivalent of 44 operating days at the end of 2026. Um, for the time being, um, we looked at several scenarios. Um, we decided as a committee that we would postpone the consideration of an additional tax levy until 2023. I did place those scenarios at your seats tonight, um, but they are the ones that we reviewed at Finance Committee. The um, next forecast will be in November. Of course, we'll have, we always have um, newer information at that time, but I do want to point out um, a lot of the discussions tonight um, on the um, assumptions, which when you look at those, what I did was I took November 2021 assumptions, and then I just added at the end of each section in bold, um, basically what changed. Um, but the very last note that I make, and this will be submitted to the state, is that forecasted amounts in fiscal years 2024 through 2026 may be significantly affected by collective bargaining agreements that are not in the forecast, um, and that will occur again in 2023. State budget legislation in 2023 and 2025, those are the biennial cycles, and the expiration of ARP ESSER funding in 2024. So those are some very significant unknowns in this forecast. And Ms. Perry, thank you for making it to tonight's meeting. I know it's not easy for you to be here, um, but you guys have the summaries that she put in there on page 105. It talks about the raise that we just approved and how that came out of ESSER two money. So we won't have that after 2000, at the end of the year, we're gonna run out of the ESSER money. So that's all extra money we received that we're not going to receive again. And um, I think the, the forecast speaks for itself in that regard. That, that's a good point, Mr. Perez, that um, ESSER 2, I am bringing it back into the forecast. Um, the general fund will have to sustain that because that was a replacement. But ARP, ESSER, which we call ESSER 3, that is not currently sustained in the forecast. And then you already put the wellness money into the general fund, correct now? Yes. What was left? Yes, that's also reflected in the forecast. Um, if the biennial legislation for state funding um, does what the last one do, did and and continues the phase in of the fair school funding plan, then that will offset anything that we need to bring back in to sustain um, that's being funded by ESSER 3 right now. But that that's an unknown and the economy has changed greatly um, since the fair school funding plan was passed as well. Any other questions for Mrs. Perry? Thank you. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 8.13. Approve NCO ESC educational services contract for fiscal year 2023. It's the annual um, contract from the uh, Educational Service Center based on what their estimates for uh, cost programming for the upcoming school year. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Um, so now we enter into discussion. Uh, Dr. Seller, are we receiving a per pupil cost for these services? I'll have to defer to Mrs. Perry, I don't believe it's per pupil. So I know last year, especially as it, as it relates to the preschool, so I, I actually think this is the second year. I think there's been two years where we've discussed this, at least in this setting, for the, the preschool cost for our students who go to FLC. Are we receiving per pupil breakdown? N no, we are not. Um, but it, it, is, it is a pool of students from um, several districts um, so it depends on the number of students. The per pupil amount will fluctuate, um, but I do not have enough information to determine that amount. I, yes. I see right here it says preschool special needs per pupil calculation, 36 pupils, $639, 800, 639 dollars 864 
$1,500.54. Which comes out $17,774.01 per student. That was my question. So if they have less than 36 students, do we get the per like rate for each one back at 177? Or are we paying that 600,000, whether we have 36, 38 or 12 or two students in there? I guess I'd like to know what, what it costs us to, to educate those special needs kids. Right, good point. How much do we spend, Michelle? Okay. So with that, I mean, we would have, will we have to uh, lose some typicals? We would not lose typicals because we would have one to launch. Still have one to one. Right now, there is some law drafting going through the Ohio Revised Code. They set up the law July 1st, 2021, and it is not sitting well across the state. It is not written the best. So it is now back for a draft to allow us to have more typicals than special needs children for licensing purposes and for having those typicals. Regardless, regardless, I'm starting the year off with about 50 children on IEPs. If I add the other 36, and I'm not suggesting that, that's not my recommendation at this point, uh, but if I did, we could do that and have 86 children on, on uh, IEPs, and I could easily put the other 86 children in that are typical. I have almost 200 on my typical. Are these 36 students listed? Are these all Tiffin City kids? And if so, how are they determined where they go? understanding we have students who are identified as Tiffin City School students but are going to FLC but we don't verify residency but we pay for them at FLC correct what we receive is a line item with the student's name and then they are attending and I'm not sure enough of what other information is on there but there is no address and there is no proof of residency so in Tiffin City Schools, because we do um, registration, parents must bring a utility bill, a piece of mail, as verification that they live in our district. And that is put in part of their file. Um, I have not received any of that information from the Family Learning Center in my time here. And did you... Sorry, I don't mean to monopolize. Did you also say that we're not doing the evaluations for these services? We do not have the services. We do not receive any information on where the children are performing or unless it's through the IEP and the progress report, we do not have that. Is this, is this like an open enrollment type situation where the people can choose where to go? I would just love if this was open It's not, it's not that. It okay. is not an open enrollment. Okay. Because parents did 
you want to take your children to another place. And this is not about people not taking their children where they want them to go. Honestly, I believe it's fiscal responsibility for us to encourage our parents and enforce the state law of open enrollment. Those parents then can choose any place to send their children that will accept that open enrollment. And I will say further, I have children who come from Finley, Fremont, Victoria, uh, Mohawk, Daisy, that have filled out that open enrollment paperwork and they attend Lincoln. So we don't require open enrollment for our students to go to FLC. Does that mean that we're responsible? So for the preschool, if you're on an IEP, we have to transport, correct? Yes, because we have this open contract with the ESD, we pay them up front, and then we also do the transportation. And one of the costs that we do not see on here are the related therapies. So we get an additional charge for occupational therapy and an additional charge for physical therapy. And unfortunately, our interim special ed director and myself have not been included on the additional services that have been added for Chicken City School to pay for that were not approved ahead of time. Would we still incur the cost for those? Yes. Okay. And we pay PT services. The only way that we knew that that was occurring is that one of the service providers also provides for us and they share that information. Okay, so we would have visibility into that uh, before the fact instead of after the fact. Absolutely. Okay. So if we would have to say in the screening process, the recommendation, uh, when they are allowed to provide these services, uh, you know, we would we would see the documented the data proving the need for it, and we don't have access to it. So just I'm just thinking as in my my mom role and like my like my kids when we went through, but also like friends who have kiddos. There's a a number of districts around us where the policy is because FLC is phenomenal. My my own daughter went through FLC, but if we look at you know the that financial responsibility piece, most of the districts around here, their policy is you have to if you're going to go there, you open enroll. Our district currently can't provide the services that are offered at the FLC. Before our preschool was open and became this, uh, the special needs preschool, that was the only option. If, if we had a student that had special needs identified at the age of three, they went to the FLC because that was the facility that they could receive the services. Now, in district, we are able to provide FAPE, which is free and appropriate in education. So therefore, they would need to open enroll if they're choosing to go somewhere else because we offer it in house. That's the Ohio, that's the Ohio district. Okay, so it it sounds to me like we're just we we were providing we we were doing what we needed to do and that we didn't have these services, so they're they're placed or they they go to FLC or whichever school they choose. We we cover that, but now that we have a comprehensive special education preschool. We're meeting the requirement of the state. So if somebody opts to go outside, that's, absolutely. That's so great. I felt like I was yelling. I'm so sorry. So I just wanted to come to the mic and articulate even further that you're absolutely right. The FLC and the ESC have provided a tremendous service to our families for well over 20 years. I give them tremendous kudos. They have been such a partner in education. They were able to provide a service when Tiffin City and many of the county schools did not have that. But Aaron is absolutely correct. We do have a preschool and we are able to service those children in house. And I believe, and this is just my old fashioned Michelle to it, I believe it is our duty, our right, and our privilege to tender and take care of our families. Now, with that means, if those families have an, a choice beside Tiffin City Schools, I will help them get there. If they want to attend whatever school they want for their child, those are babies. And we need to be very encouraging and supportive to our parents that they attend the school that that parent feels comfortable with. But I encourage you 
to encourage parents and su be supportive that they just follow the open enrollment policy that's been set forth by the Ohio State Department of Education. The other caveat and positive piece that comes with that is I work with Molly Depew, our psychologist. When a parent has a concern, whether they come to us through early intervention or they come to us from outside, Molly, one of my teachers, myself, other related therapies are able to sit down, meet that family, welcome that family, provide an assessment if necessary, and then provide the supports. At this time, we are not afforded that. And Tiffin City Schools is the local educational agencies agency. And regardless of who we partner or contract with, when things are not done accordingly, Tiffin City Schools, our team, are the ones who must write the corrective action plan regardless of whether they attend in-house or not. And so I would like to just clean it up, make sure that we are following the policies that Ohio State has set forth, thank those who have been partners with us, and moving forward, help those families get to where they need to be. I just have a question on uh, open enrollment. Um, if we if someone open rolls from our district to another district, are, are we responsible for the cost that the other district provides, or are we responsible for just what our cost would be? So what would happen is we would be responsible for the goals that are outlined in that IEP and the cost attached thereto. So if we have a child who is going to be identified for speech, that's a pretty simple cost. Um, the child, we, we have foundation money that comes in, we are then billed back, and then we pay for that child. If we have a child who has more intensive needs or is in need of additional therapy, those costs are incurred, and we are responsible for those as the district of residence. Um, typically, always, as the resident district, we are invited to those IEPs as we invite the districts. And we have a say at the table, too. We're part of the team just as the other district is. And we get to learn about that child and what's going to help support them in their educational process. And so as a team, we agree to those services, we agree to the goals in the IEP plan, and then we bring that back. And if they are for open enrollment, then we make sure that we pay those costs. So if a student open enrolls, so right now they don't have to open enroll. If we require open enrollment, there's no loss of services for the students. Absolutely not. That IEP follows that student no matter where they go. But the difference is the cost to the district. So right now, without it's it's almost like we're operating as if FLC is one of is a Tiffin City school. And so we pay for the basically like the entire cost and transportation. But if it were open enrollment, we only pay for the services identified in the IEP. My understanding so is so I really, I know, I know that you're business people and I know that sometimes we have to look at that, that cost, but I really don't want to make that this point right now. I, I really don't respectfully because every child is worth every penny that we spend on them. And as a team, we decide that what I'm saying is this, those are our children. And as you just articulated perfectly, that is not a Tiffin City Schools program. It's been operated as such in the past because we had board members that felt, these are our students, let's pay that up front. Let's go ahead and pay that up front because there is a cost and it, there's a lapse of about 18 months, correct? Sharon, there's a lapse if they open enroll on how we pay that back. So. In due diligence, it was, you know what, let's just go into the contract and let's pay that up front because that's a lot of money for someone to have to wait 18 months for payment. We are at a point right now where we're talking about 20 kiddos. And, and, and like I said before, this is not about let's shut it down, let's make sure those kids come. No. My recommendation would be those kiddos that are already enrolled, we simply have the, those families fill out an open enrollment and we keep them right there, right where they are most comfortable. But moving forward, every single screen, 
every single meeting through early intervention, through play-based, would come through our psychiatric or our psychologist and our special ed department, then we, as the LEA, Local Educational Agency, as we are told through the state of Ohio, we then work with that family. It is our right, our privilege, our duty, our honor to be able to help them. Is that part of this contract? Is that it is part of the contract. What happens if uh, this contract today is asking us to enter in a contract for an approximate 36 students for the preschool program? Um, what we've been told in the past is that once we agree to this contract, it then enters into the interagency agreement, which is part of Seneca County. And um, unfortunately, we read it differently, unfortunately. So, so I, in the interest of uh, moving on, is, 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 can we change the number? I mean, is that what you're, is that what you would recommend? Change just, the number? I'm just wondering, like, because we have an open enrollment policy yeah. for all other students. Are we able to apply the open enrollment policy here with these students? I, I don't know what the, what the protocol is for the solution. Is it this contract or is it following our open enrollment policy? I don't know what the, what the process would be either. What my recommendation would be is to pull this out and table it and to have a conversation with the ESC to say, moving forward, we would like the students that are going to enroll to go through that open enrollment policy. Um, again, I cannot state strongly enough what a fabulous service they have offered our families and our students for over 20 years. But as we move forward, the state has become very clear that this is coming back on us. We need to be providing the very best services and be aware of what is happening. It sounds to me like we have open enrollment for everybody above pre-K. Yes. So what we're asking or, or what you're suggesting is that we have to have open enrollment for all of our kids, not just from one up. That's right. And or in, K up, I'm sorry. In preschool, open enrollment is only required for students on an IEP. It's kind of crazy. But a typical student can go anywhere they want for preschool, anywhere. If they are on an IEP, they have to open enroll. Okay, and that's because if you're not an IEP, you're paying for it yourself, so your money follows you in that regard. But I guess, I guess when we did the policy, because I have to, you know, disclosure, my kid went to FLC and got great service, so I'm really concerned about ensuring that we have that choice for people here. Absolutely, I think we've been big about that, but. You know, here's here's the beauty of I it. I think at that point when we did it, we were trying to reserve to make sure our Tiffin City School kids got in before other kids because that was the center in the area mm -hmm. with how many schools going into it at that point. Seneca, East, Hopewell, Mohawk, yes. Old Fort. Yes. So. Yes. They've all gone to open enrollment. We also have parents that want to go to Calvert and do not believe that their service is there. We provide itinerant services. And I'm working with Calvert right now to make sure that we have our people going in and providing those services. Choice is important. Parents should have a choice on where they want to send their children. But while they have that choice, they need to follow the protocol and the processes set up by the state of Ohio. And I'm just asking that we can encourage that and support that for all of our students pre-K through 12. So are we able to, Dr. Zeller or Mrs. Perry, are we able to table this so that that can be um, addressed so that, because I think all the other pieces are um, a, a appropriate or didn't stand out. Are we able to go back to the table and address that we follow the open enrollment policy and, and then bring this back? Is that a possibility? We can try. Well, the, the other piece is though, and I've brought the, sorry doc, but I brought this up with the previous superintendent. We pay for one um, social worker in district and then we contract with the other has there been any thought of just having them both in-house? I think we've experimented to the point that we know we're going to need them and keeping them here where we can use them five days a week versus four, I think, is what we have Jill at. I'm not the one budgeting for the long terms. We have had that discussion. Unfortunately, the, the salary for the ESC social worker is higher than what our salary schedule goes for our in-house. So I guess I'm still not quite sure that, Michelle, you said it, the policy already is in place that we do the evaluations, right? Yeah, the transparent 
Yeah. To be the LEA. To, to be, to step in as the LEA and okay. the district representative. All right. And I have asked that we keep that role. And unfortunately, it's been very confused. Well, it's, it, well it was that a year ago. We had the same, yeah, we've had this conversation before. What's what's different? Nothing changes that. You, I mean, you, we had the same conversation a year ago, and... Did anybody sit down and, and discuss? Okay, all right. Because yeah, we, I think we've had it twice where we've asked for data and for us to be able to be at the the table for identification, um, for clarifying some of those line item pieces, but also I I, I believe we have a an open enrollment policy, so it, it seems like we could go back and look at our policy that is in place for our entire district and apply that here. Um, so it seems like that that's worth uh, going back to the table and, and re-evaluating uh, this contract so that we are being fiscally sound, seeing as we do now have a, a comprehensive preschool program with the ability to evaluate and identify, which meets the requirement of the laws, correct? And, and you know, I know you don't want to hear this, but it is a dollars and cents issue, you know. And, and the point is, is if we can... Uh, if we can use the district's money more efficiently, and we and you just pointed out that they're paying the social worker more money than we do, so obviously their people are getting paid more than we pay. So we're going to provide a service that's equal or better at lower cost than we should be, right? I mean, am I wrong? I think you're right, Dr. Okay, Dr. that's yeah. all. That's yeah. all I want to know is that. Right, right, but but I have never not in any way, not I don't ever want to come out of my mouth I, that anything ugly. Right, we've I, we've been through this. That that ugliness was like five or six years ago. That that's over. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the, we need to right, the right, and I think we've 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 been this, through this with the ESC. You know, we've a lot of we buried the hatchet years ago. With Doc Lahowski, and and now I think Brenda, you know, is yeah. a good relationship with her. So I I don't see a problem there. I just think that we owe it to our district to use funds to the best we can. And if we're spending more money than we need to for a service that we can provide as good or better, then it's incumbent upon us, you know, as fiscally uh, good stewards of our money, that we should we should do that. So I. I you know, I don't know how this is. Is it a handshake agreement? Is this is this a contractual thing that we should do? Is it what what does it mean? It was set in place that whole year. It's just kind of rolled over. Okay. Um, to no one's fault. It's just another contract that comes through. And I think that we need to pick it apart and really shop it and say, Thank you. Yes, we need this. Yes, we need this. The same as we do with PT services and right. public exactly. services. Exactly. How much how much time would it take to do that, Michelle? I'm sorry. How much time would it take to do that? I would say we could agree to and we do agree to everything else but the prepaid services. And that is easily remedied through an open enrollment form. Parents can still take their children out there. Okay. Well, I don't know if we can speak for the contract that they would want to we probably need to table it, right. have the whole thing go back, have you know, our super and our representatives there, our treasurer, sit down and, and share that we are we need to apply our open enrollment policy across the board. What does that contract now look like? I don't know that we have the, I don't know that we can pick apart a contract that, that uh, they've well, yeah. to put fair, together. To be fair, they've probably, already, they've probably already done their contracts for their teachers out there. So even if we sat down and we said there's 20 kids right now there, we will contract for 20. 
and then every other child that comes in, we want an open enrollment. I mean, like we don't want to. We this is not about cutting them off the leg. This is about doing what's right. So pay for those twenty kids up front. Okay, we got these twenty. Here's the name. Here's the residential piece. La la la. Then I can't do that. So sorry. Then we move forward. Every other child after that comes through us. And if they choose to go to EFLC, we will help them fill out that open enrollment. If they want to go to Hobo, if they want to go to New Regal, if they want to go wherever, we will help them with that paperwork. I will set up a tour. I will introduce them. I will get them where they need to be. So, so are we able, um, Dr. Dollar, are we able to table this, send it back with the administration to then revisit this so that we can apply that, that policy that's already in place across the board and then y'all can bring it back? Yes. And Dr. Zoller, though, do you need the ones approving our staff at the be the bottom there parsed out? Would you want a motion for at least for the director of teaching, learning, gifted coordinator, that portion approved tonight? Or would they want the whole thing in total? I don't know that we can, like Dr. McBride said, I, I don't know that we can okay. piecemeal Thank their you. proposal. Well, and so then knowing that we also have employees on there as well, and we don't want to harm that um, if it can, if it needs to be, it could come to a, a special board meeting, which mm -hmm. I'm guessing we're going to have to call within a, mm -hmm. a week or so. So if y'all can expedite that meeting to get those pieces in place, I don't want to hurt any of the, mm -hmm. any of our employees um, who are contracted in this as well. But I do think that we need to put a plan in place moving forward, especially that for that that fiscal responsibility piece. Absolutely, we can communicate that to the ESC. Do I have a any other discussion? If not, I'll ask for a motion to table. So moved. Thank you. Have a second. Second. Mrs. Perry. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. Gates. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Um, 8.14 is the termination of the OPC grievance. This was brought forward um, at the April 25th, 22 board meeting um, for this piece. Uh, if a board member is to motion, I need a board member to motion either to grant or deny the grievance. Grant would be in support. Deny would be does not support. Uh, I will go ahead and make a motion to deny the OPC grievance. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry. Dr. McBride. Yes. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Dr. Gase. Abstain. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. I um, not opportunity for public to dialogue with the board. Hello, my name is Erin Simmons and I live at 178 Charlotte Street. Um, I have several students here in the district. Um, about two and a half weeks ago, I sent out an email asking for a meeting about some issues with the special education department and services that were being provided. I invited Mr. Bose, Dr. Zoller, and Megan McBride. I invited Molly, our school psych. I also invited um, Erin Gillig and I invited Michelle to it and I also invited um, Lindsay Rellinger. Lindsay Rellinger and Molly and Aaron Gillig showed up to that meeting to discuss those issues. I did not hear from a single board member, none of the administration. I'm at my living room watching the board meeting tonight and I heard from Dr. Zoller this evening that the three of you were able to meet with a parent that was complaining about a coach being let go. I gave over a week and a half notice that this was an important meeting, there were violations to discuss, and I got no response. So I came to the meeting tonight, and I would like a response tonight is, why is my child's education not as important as a sports event? I'll, I'll just respond. I believe that initial invitation, the meeting was scheduled and then changed, and then the, the meeting date that it was changed to, I was ill. I was not able to attend that meeting, or I would have attended. 
your child's educational needs are not less important than the educational needs of any other student in the district, including our athletes. So I apologize for not being able to make that meeting. I'm certainly able to meet with you in the future, but I was not able to attend that meeting last week. So it was Aaron Simmons, correct? Yes. Thank you. I didn't know if you had a question. So Ms. Simmons, you and I have talked on numerous occasions regarding this meeting. I asked a question, I said, is this a meeting where I'm supposed to be at? There's lots of meetings where I'm made aware of and try very hard to recognize my role as board member to not overstep. And there's a, a chain that it typically goes through. I asked if I was needed to attend. It was my understanding it was the first meeting with possibility of escalation. So knowing that I would probably have to attend a, an escalation piece. So I, I made that judgment call based off of recognizing where my role is or isn't. So I just tried to be mindful of that. In the email, it was stated that it has escalated beyond the first meetings. I've been trying for six years to improve the standards and the services of my children and those in the district. I work very hard to help those in the district. Um, and it has gotten to the point where this is not the first meeting where I've invited administration to please be a part of it, and they haven't been. It's very frustrating to sit there and listen to you say how important and you're fighting for coaches, but when you have a parent that is saying, help our children, help our district. I sat at that table with Aaron and Lindsay, and I said, this is nothing personal against you, but this is six years of dealing with this, and it needs to be addressed. Those issues have not been addressed. They've been pushed aside numerous times. I have several parents who are just as upset as I am. They're just not here right now. And I have no problem saying it needs to change. I have asked politely. I have addressed, I have nine pages worth of meetings that I've, I've had within the district, whether it's administrative, whether it's with the aides or it's with the teachers. I'm trying and I am not getting a response. I'm getting closed doors from the district here. So, so I, wanna, I wanna help, um, I, I, I wanna help, I want to understand, um, so the pieces that are, are here tonight are pieces that were to be voted on, are pieces that are, are brought to the board for, for consideration. So those pieces we get to weigh in on. Extended school year services was one of the issues that was brought up in that meeting, which is the board decision and the administration services. You have a summer learning program for your children, which is a Title I program that entitles children to 128 hours of summer school learning. I have four children in IEPs. Three of those children are allowed to attend that summer school program. My child, who has more severe needs, was told he's not allowed to attend that program. He was only entitled to ESY services, which was a total of nine hours. How can you choose between one IEP versus another IEP? They all have needs. Some are more, more significant. Some do require more help, but it doesn't mean you ignore them and say they're too difficult so they don't get the 128 hours. That's discriminatory. You can't do that. But that's what this, this district is doing. That was what I wanted to discuss, one of many issues, which is part of the board's responsibility. Certainly. Erin, can I just talk on behalf of yes. Summer Extended Services? Amazing program, Jen. You know I love no. that program. I, and I appreciate your kind words. But please understand when we're talking about extended learning opportunities for our students, the most important thing during that time frame is to make sure that we're addressing the needs. So in all fairness, if we're going to do that, I want to make sure that we have the correct staffing in place for that. So understand that I believe we're working to address that for you, but there may have to be some adjustments for all students. Um, we have some staffing issues. Um, we have 52 students who are currently signed up for our summer program. And in all honesty, I have three full-time teachers. And in all fairness to our teachers and, and our aides and anyone who wants to staff that, 
they're tired. Oh, and, I agree and, wholeheartedly. And so I will do everything that I can. And so will every other administrator and every other teacher, but understand that there may be changes for all students and, and that would encompass your students also. And I respect that. And that's why I asked for the meeting. And that's why I wanted to discuss. And I sat with Aaron and I sat with Lindsay and Molly and understand there are staffing issues and there are some guidelines. I understand that. I had this issue last year, the same time last year, and was told, we'll address it. We'll get to it. Next year will be different. However, here we are this year again, and we're in the exact same boat. There's three days left of school, and I still do not have an answer of what my son's ESY is going to look like. We have three days left, and I still have not received any information except we're working on it. And I don't. We're looking, and I don't recall this email. Did you send it to Dr. McBride? Or... I, I did. I sent it to Dr. McBride. Okay. And so she is appropriate when she said that. So as a board, I think we're hearing this. And so I don't think I value you any less than the other students. I, I know they don't. And so at this point, I, what I would ask is, you know, I, I'm hearing you now, and so I'd ask you for some time for us, because one of our duties is we don't handle the day-to-day, -day, but we can ask our administrators to explain some of this to us, because we don't know everything. And just if you give us the opportunity, I, I'm sure we'll be able to go over with them. And I know you're saying it's been years, and I can't promise you that it'll be like in two hours or anything. But I think if you, you know, again, some of us are hearing for this for the first time. I know you've been living it. But if you give us the opportunity to look into this, that's all I would ask. And I appreciate that. And I completely understand that. That was my point of coming up here tonight is I have tried with the administration. I've asked them to show up. And time and time again, they don't. That is my point for bringing it up this mm -hmm. evening so that it is brought to your attention that I have tried. And you ask any one of the teachers who have worked with me, any one of the aides that have worked with me, I am very passionate about this program in this school district. I only want what's best but there's not fair and equal treatment here in Stephen City Schools. And I've followed policies and procedures and I've done what I'm supposed to do, follow the steps, and I'm asking you to pick it up. I'm, I'm tired of forcing the issue. And that was that email of, I'm taking the next steps because I've exhausted everything else in this district. So I would really appreciate it if you would consider it. I would be more than happy to talk to you and tell you in detail my experience, which is not unlike many in this school district. I would be more than happy to fill you in on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Hi there. Uh, Courtney Williams, 43 Frost Parkway. Um, just a question about high school principal. I have uh, soon to be incoming freshmen. So very curious on how the process is going, if the board's aware of, have we got anybody applying? Do we have the position out there? Any interviews? What's going on? What does that timeline look like? Thank you. We, uh, we roughly have 20 applicants for the position. Um, some have experience, some do not. And it has been made, um, it's been made clear with our current superintendent situation search that those individuals would like to be involved in the process, whoever that one person may be. So as soon as we make that determination, uh, the high school principal search will, will um, accelerate um, beyond what it has been so far. Okay, so you already have people in the pipeline ready to go as far as interviews and second interviews, things like that, once the new superintendent comes on board? We, we have not narrowed it down to a, to a certain number of, of candidates at this point, but as soon as the new superintendent is made, we will be moving forward with the search. All right, thank you. Any other um, members of the public? So I think that is a nice segue into our board discussion, and I do want to be very mindful of time as we've kept you all here very late this evening. Um, the only piece for a board discussion is the superintendent search update. 
Um, so at this point, um, we do have our final interviews tomorrow. We narrowed the candidate pool down to two um, after the, the last few rounds and all the community feedback, um, which we did have an extensive amount of community feedback. And it is, um, we have two very strong candidates who could um, both do a phenomenal job. So tomorrow that we will meet here and we will meet with both candidates and then deliberate and hope to call a special board meeting in short order to be able to ad address the contract, trying to find appropriate language. Uh, any other pieces to that? Board members, no? Um, but we did ask, one of the questions we did ask each of the candidates is, we have a high school principalship open um, and there is a desire that, that both candidates shared uh, to be a part of that process if able, but also if our, you know, for whatever reason our candidate's not here, then we do have to move forward with hiring a principal. Mm -hmm. So that is where the, the administration is on the high school principal is hoping to do that in uh, combination with the soon to be named superintendent. Any discussion on that? Any other pieces? I have another piece, uh, doesn't do with the superintendent, but last week I got to serve as a grandparent and as a board rep to Kraut and went on the third grade tour. And I wanna tell you, that was a fantastic tour. Um, I told a couple of presenters that I've lived here for um, 70, 70 years and I learned things that I had never heard of before. It was fantastic. The kids were very well behaved. It was extremely well organized and the presenters did a fabulous job. I was quite proud to be a part of Tiffin City Schools and after hearing all the high school awards, it makes me just grin from ear to ear. There are a lot of good things going on in Tiffin City Schools. So to add to that, I live across the street from the Seneca County Museum and our students represented our school district very well. So I waited all day for Mr. Kisbeth to walk by my house so I could wave. I probably should have been working. <laughs> That's a different story, but I would just like to say every group of students that walked by was very well behaved. Um, yeah, it was just a very good representation of, of Tiffin City Schools. I'm very proud of them. Mr. Kisbeth, it was so great to see it back. I did. I got to do it twice with my two kids, and I, it's kind of odd. And I got to thank his honor for hosting again. But we walked in, and they're like, "There's this mayor. Everybody knows who the mayor is." I got to go to the police station to see the soldier and to thank the church for hosting him for lunch. But it's it's great, and the museum for hosting him as well. And our kids do really well, and it's like they're part of our community, and the community takes them in. But thank you for volunteering to do that as well. I got a little nervous for my own sake when we went to the Glass Museum. And thank you to the Glass um, Museum yeah, too, because they all... I had to be very careful. One last thing I would like to say, our business department and our two JA teams took second and third in the nation. That is unbelievable. We're not talking the state, we're talking the nation. That was unbelievable. I certainly appreciate the work that the kids did and and Miss Geiger did to get them ready. That's a that's a fantastic accomplishment. Any other pieces from the board? I do not believe that we have executive session. Um, we do have um, a executive session or special board meeting tomorrow evening, and our next regular board meeting is June twenty seventh at six thirty p.m. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I'm gonna say, don't all jump at once. Mrs. Perry. Dr. Case. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Thank you all and have a great night.